I've changed 10 million diapers and they weren't pampers. They were a cloth. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it is a nasty business. I had sat up with the sick kids, helping them with their homework, washed their clothes. We did 60 loads of laundry a week in our house. I had to make 10 sandwiches a day for their lunch. It was just, uh, you know, I'd had enough. And I said, I'm, I'm not going to have six kids for anybody. Then God got a hold of me later in my prayer closet. You are going to marry him. You are going to have three kids. You're going to have three daughters. I need that holy seed. You are going to marry him. You go make a deal with him. <laughs> God, I tell you what, if you say I'll do anything for you, you better be ready because I gave him permission. I went back to him. I said, well, I'll, I'll make a deal. <laughs> I will have three, (laughs) five years apart, because I want long rest. My mom had eight kids by the time she was 28, and I was the chief babysitter. Then she had eight or seven more when we came down to Florida. Oh, yeah, and I was number three. My oldest sister ran away and got married. I didn't blame her. My older brother went to the military. I didn't blame him either. And my sister under me went to Bible college. They left you-know-who to take care of the crew. And all of the animals, too. Hey, I just rhymed. <laughs> so I was not looking for that kind of a life. I went, I'll, I'll, I'll make a deal. I said, I'm going to marry you, not because I can live with you. I'm going to marry you because I can't live without you. I was so in love with him. I'll marry you because I can't live without you. But you're going you're gonna to promise me we'll have three kids, five years apart, and you will never, ever tell me I can't buy pampers. Because <laughs> I am not going to be the health nut. I'm not putting cloth diapers on my kids. I'm going to put something I can throw away and never see again. <laughs> We made a deal. And 33 years later, we're still here. 33. We had three daughters, all do dance ministry, all love God with all their heart. And they are, you know, the holy seed he wanted. And I gave it to him and I paid in full. Hallelujah. (laughs) Now, the first two we had five years apart. The, The third one... With that second one, I needed seven years. So he cut me some slack and let me have two more years for the, that last one came along. <laughs> but, but you know what? You have to be willing to hear God and obey God. But we learned about passionate power like two years ago. And I'm letting you tell you, it works. It works, it works, it works. Lay aside your feelings. Lay aside your headaches. Lay aside your differences. And just crank up some passionate power. And you wait and see what happens to your finances. I challenge you. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? It's obeying God. You are actually, this is symbolic of Christ and his pride, his church. When he loves you, he gives you everything you need. When you love him, you feel so filled and so happy and satisfied. And it will produce warfare. And this is what God said. When are my married couples going to stop making war and start making warfare? War is fighting, not loving. Loving is warfare, in case you didn't get it. So stop making war, start making warfare. When we tonight come down here and I stir up and release in, uh, stir up and activate the anointing in you, I'm going to have the married couples make a separate line. You're going to get passionate power released into you. Don't get in that line if you're not married. <laughs> you don't need to get yourself in trouble. <laughs> So that was my little mini message. Did you find the music? Okay, everybody stand up. This is the middle of the service, so please don't leave after you dance. you got to hear about where you came from inside God. you got to hear about the stones of fire where Lucifer walked, why he said he was like the Most High. Um, and then you're going to get become the violent to take by force from the enemy. So, But right now, we're going to run this dance. And... When you get, did y'all receive some revelation tonight already? Let me see. See, you need to start changing your mindset because there's a time coming on this earth where you won't want to live in church. The manifested presence of God will be so powerful you'll see angels holding open the doors for you to come in. 
you'll see their band playing with the worship team. The glory cloud will sit in these places. You'll stay for hours and not care. You will pay someone to go and do your job so you don't have to leave the presence of God. That's what's coming. That's one of the things coming. So, um, where's Jen? I'm going to let her help. Jen is my baby sister. Oh, this is the caboose on the train. My parents' train. This is a caboose right here. My dad called her the caboose number 15. And he actually let all the kids vote for her name. Now, wasn't that nice? All the boys wanted to call her Julie. He wanted Betty Lou. My dad wanted Betty Lou. <laughs> that burned and went down in flames. And all of us girls wanted Jennifer. And we won. <laughs> we won because that would make eight girls and seven boys. <laughs> we were actually betting on whether it was going to be a boy or girl. We knew it was going to be a girl. God loved us more. <laughs> And sent Jennifer. And so she's going to teach you this dance. Um, the first movement means you're receiving revelation. The second one means you're praising God for the revelation. And the third one means you're going to share it everywhere. It actually makes sense. And the angels do this dance. If you think you look funny, picture them. These 15 foot angels in their gowns with their big old wings. And they're doing this. They look like the uh, soul trained backup dancers. For some of you who don't know what Soul Train was, it was a, it was a black music show. Where, yeah, it was Soul Train, and they put a lot of soul in their music, and they always had the backup dancers, you know. And they all moved in such unison. Well, that's what the, the angels all look like when they do that. So, okay, so the first movement means you're, yeah, you're getting revelation or digging up treasure. This is the first movement. Go ahead. You got a scoop. There you go. That's like digging up treasure. That Y'all do it. Oh, you're digging it up? Yeah, you're digging it up. It's like you're receiving revelation. You're, you're getting revelation. Yeah, let me see that mic for a second. Yes, yeah, not sure on. Turn it off. Yeah, I, I think we got something turned loose back here. That's okay. Let me see the, let me see the, the, the battery. Okay, I'll go get another battery. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Mike, the battery's like dead. Yeah. Y'all are practicing really good. <laughs> I blew the battery. It was the power of God. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. There we go. Oh, I get a cord. Look at this. I got a cord on my microphone. <laughs> I do jump rope with it. Something more to play with. Okay, y'all, next movement, next movement. So the first one is you're receiving revelation. The second one is you're praising God for that revelation. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Lord. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's doing it differently. <laughs> y'all do it in one direction. Start with this direction. Everybody this way, then that way. Okay, all right. Oh, I lost my cord there. All right, that means you receive, that means you're praising God. So the first one is you're receiving revelation. The second one is you're praising God for the revelation. And the third one is you're going to share it everywhere. This means you're sharing it. Got to show them first. First, do this. You're going to share it. And this means everywhere. like kids when you do this because you are really connecting with heaven whoever knew you could connect with heaven by doing this and we, we practice it to a count of eight it, it helps some people some people forget it until you get to heaven but we're going to practice it to a count of eight so let's do that ready one two three four five six seven eight one two three four five six Seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Woo! And and we used to do this to any kind of music. 
music and the father told me one time he goes no I want you to use this other music he said the enemy's been stealing music for years so I'm going to take some of his that he thinks is his and I'm going to use it for me so if you want to go to iTunes get the instrumental version of Everybody Dance Now and that's what he said I want you to use because my people are going to learn to dance when you're doing this dance right now all of your family and friends at the portal will be dancing with you and and everyone in the throne room will be doing this too so literally you will feel you will begin to feel heaven pour out on you and the way you'll know it's being poured out is you'll start to laugh and all the ones not doing it you're the ones standing out <laughs> like sore thumbs so let's get ready and uh, crank it up we'll do it about three times and if we have time we'll do it at the end but I don't, I want, I don't want you to leave without doing the stand so get ready yeah <laughs> okay are y'all ready let's, let's go turn it up <laughs> Hold on. I, I've seen them do all kinds of dancing, line dancing. Can you imagine a million people line dancing and not running into each other? They have things that look like minuets. Then they do crazy things where you just stand there and dance wildly, jumping up and down. And then they do beautiful stuff. They do the circle dances like the, the Hebrew people do. All kinds. I've seen Jesus come off his throne and all the guys line up in a big line all the way across the throne room like this and they all link shoulders like in the Greek dancing and they make this huge wave that goes all the way around. You get out of the way, women, because those men are going to dance. It's powerful when men dance for God. It is really powerful when men dance. God wants you to dance. Do we, do we find it? They're practicing up there. Oh, uh, let's practice one more time, okay? Grace. Oh, Grace, yeah. Oh, I'm going to tell you about Grace real quick. Another thing he did was catch me up to the throne one time for this one. He didn't want me to show up out in my house anymore when I got up in the morning. And he said, if you will learn to do this, then you will be filled with fuel from heaven every day. We're saved by grace, but there's, there's grace for abundant life. You get saved by grace for eternal life. But God said, when I sent my son to the earth, if you look in the scriptures, it'll say, I filled him with my grace as a child. That grace is grace for abundant life. That's one of the reasons why Christ walked through this life and didn't let things touch him. And he said, my word says to come before the throne of grace to find grace for help in time of need. That would be every day of our life. You find it. You come before it and find it. He said, this is how you find it. Every morning when you wake up, you look up and say this, Father, Father I, ask for and I ask for and receive abundant grace for this day. And then he said, when you do that, I will fill you with fuel from heaven for that day. You, I feel the Spirit of God on me. He loves it when I share this. You won't be the same person when you come out in that, out of that room. You won't be you. You will have every bit of thing, whatever you need in your life for that day, you'll have it from heaven. And every day you get up, you ask for it. You find grace when you go for a throne. You ask for it. And it doesn't cost you anything. People will ask you what's wrong with you. Things won't touch you. It's like you get filled with heaven. It's like you can't get offended. You don't get angry. Fear doesn't come in you. My family asked me, what did you do? I taught all of them to do it. We do not have strife in our home. Okay, they got it. So we're ready? Yeah. It's not going to be a video, but that's fine. Oh, that's okay if we can hear the music. So everybody, don't forget to what? We are the video. Don't do the dance. <laughs>
By the way, I'm going to give you... I'm going to give you some, just some free, something for free. That there's exercises you can do for your eyes so you don't need reading glasses. There are exercises you can do. And... Uh, <laughs> See, when you get older, the muscles around your eyes get weak. And so it changes the shape of your eye. Instead of being round, it becomes like this. And you start to need reading glasses like I have because I've not been really good about doing them. And people actually have done these eye exercises watching me. There's a little muscle that goes around your eye like this. A thin, like it feels like fishing line. I say that because my husband's a fisherman. And actually it sits on this bone here and up here. And if you can find that little tiny muscle, people are doing that. This is important. It could change for you if you're getting tired of doing that. If you will push that. Now, I do them both at the same time to save time. you find out why in a minute. God put it on the heart of this one woman. You're still holding your eye. <laughs> he said, why do some uh, ethnic groups, why do they not wear glasses? And she actually was going to study to be an ophthalmologist. She goes, I don't know why. He goes, find out. Study and find out which group does not have to wear them most of the time. And you go there and study under an ophthalmologist and find out what they do. It was China. She went and studied under this Christian ophthalmologist in China. When you start approaching the age of 40, you go for a checkup. They teach you these exercises. They teach you them. Your muscles stay strong. Your, your eye never changes shape. It even can prevent you from seeing distance or actually reduce your prescription. And, and she proved it, and she did this video, which I just, God had me watch. I happened to catch her when she was being interviewed on television. And I tried it, and I was like 52 before I had to have reading glasses. And most people, you get 40, 45, you're going to start having to get something, you know. And, that, and it keeps going up higher and higher. And uh, when I was doing them, I didn't need them at all. So what you do is you find that little muscle here. I can feel it. You just press down it lightly and pull down. And you can actually, I'm teaching this on the video. It's for free. <laughs> God's giving it to you for free. And you will press. You go one, two, a hundred times. We're not going to do it right now. I'm just telling you. You press that. But if you do them both at the same time, like this, you'll save time. Do a hundred times here, a hundred times up here. Then you feel in here, this is the exercise she taught. You feel up in your temple till you find the part that's like really sore. You'll find it. It's that pressure point. You feel it's like, ooh, I just found it. Ooh, kind of hurts to push on it right there. That's the muscle that runs behind your eye. You press on that a hundred times. So it's actually if you do it here, here, and here, and do it at the same time, and you do that... Uh, two to three times a day until you reduce the prescription and it takes about a week, a week and a half doesn't take a long time you notice you don't need them anymore to read with after that you do it once a day I'm, I'm not kidding you will do that once a day once you learn it and you will not need reading glasses you'll never have to strain to see something you know it doesn't look like a bunch of ants walking across the paper when you look at it <laughs> My daughter said, look at this mama one. It looks like ants walking across the paper, honey. <laughs> so anyway, so these are really weak glasses. These are my stronger glasses. And sometimes they don't write so good. I'm glad you're not judging my writing. Anyway, that was for free. So now you know there's something you can do about it. Now, if it's for... I never get the far-sighted, near-sighted thing going. I think near-sighted is you can't see far away. I don't know why they call that. It should be far-sighted if you can't see far away. It's nearsighted because you can only see near. Is that it? Yeah. But not far. That does not make sense to me. <laughs> if you have that problem, you put it on the same muscle and you shake it. Now, this is a crazy thing. You shake it like this. One, two, three. And it reduces the, the farsightedness. If you press like that, it reduces you not being able to see up close. That's exactly what she taught. And how it comes to people and they're testifying about it. So she still does that today. Travels over and teaches that to people. You got it for free. You didn't have to buy the video. <laughs> Honestly, try it. I've had people come back and say, you know what? I, I did that eye thing and it worked. I'm going to start doing mine again. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking mainly from uh, Ezekiel 28. And, and I don't have all my papers. I don't need them. I've shared this so many times. I'm going to tell you... Um, It'd be nice, God, if I could find the one piece of paper. <laughs> Since they dropped on the floor. But I may not find it. 
But there is scripture in the Word of God, and a lot of people, a lot of people know the scripture. You may not know where it's found, but you need to, because if people ask you, you're supposed to be able to tell them. I love the Holy Spirit. He told me where it was. <laughs> okay, this is called the ancient paths, the mystery of life before earth. You're going to get some deep things right now, and you're going to get it really fast, and so you don't try to write it down. In Jeremiah 1 5, it says, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And then in Psalms 139, I knew you before you began to breathe. I wrote every day of your life in a book. Okay, in Hebrews 12 9, it talks about us. It talks about him being, uh, he is the father of spirits. He's not talking about angels, the father of spirits. In Acts 17, 28, in him we live and move and have our being, our existence. It says, The prophets and poets of old have spoken of these things. That's before you came here. He's talking about before you came here. Before you came to earth. It says in Ephesians 1.4, According he hath chosen us in him, in him, before the foundations of the world. That's what Ephesians 1.4 says. It talks about that. Uh, So it talks about us. And if you ever could stand before the throne of God, you, you would have seen this anyway. And a lot of people have seen it. If you stand there long enough and look at the, at, at the Father sitting on the throne, He's really big. And this glory just comes from His face, the beauty of His glory. And that goes out and becomes that rainbow that goes like this all the way around His throne. It's so beautiful. But if you, if you stood there long enough, you'd see little spirits coming in and out of the Father. They ride on the rays of glory. You, before you came to earth, you couldn't just live as a being in heaven. You weren't a being with a body. You were a little spirit. And I'm going to show you because I talked about that earlier. When God created Adam out of the dust of this earth and he leaned over, where did that spirit, Adam's spirit come from? What did God do? Say it loud. He breathed him out of himself. He breathed that spirit of Adam into that body. It was in Him. We were chosen in Him before the foundations of the world. Okay, Inside God is eternity. Inside God are not organs like you have. He is a supernatural being. If you could see inside God, you'd see the most beautiful place ever in heaven. It would be in Him. It would be endless. There is no end. If you looked inside God, it is e- eternity is there. And actually, the, uh, Jesus can stand up and step inside of God. The Holy Spirit comes and gets inside of God. That is the three in one. A real simple explanation. He showed me that one time. I'm going to show you the Godhead. Because most people struggle to think that we have a three-headed God. There's people that think that. Because there's three beings but one God. What does that mean? It's real easy. They step inside of Him. They are one. One, three in one. That is the Godhead all in one. And then they step out and are separate. When Christ said, Father, I pray that they be one even as we are one... That's what he was talking about. That literally when you go home to heaven, your spirit goes home to heaven, you have the ability to step inside the Father. He's going to show you when you go home where you came from before you came to this earth. We were all little spirits. And if you stood there long enough, you could see little spirits. They come out on the glory rays. I love to see in Him we live, we move. The only way you can move in and out of God was to ride on the glory rays that came from Him. You go in and come out. And you actually hear them saying, send me. Jesse heard the same thing. He saw the same thing. They had a little child that uh, didn't die, but he caught them up to heaven. And they said they saw fireflies coming in and out of God. That's what they said. They didn't know what to... They even tried to draw them. They even tried to draw the throne. I think it's in the book, Eight Big Big Angels or Six Big Big Angels. I didn't read the whole book, but I heard a friend who knows them that said that they saw... They called them fireflies because you look like little spirits of light. What, is, what does God say we are the... Light of the world. God is... Light. Yeah. Don't hide your... Your spirit being is made out of light. And so what you would see was these little spirits and they're different sizes and they're filled with the light of God because you lived in Him. And you see them come in and out of Him saying, Send me, send me. That's where you were before you came here. You were chosen in Him 
from the foundations before the foundations of this world. He built this earth so we could send you here to become a person and you could be on the outside of him. He could have a family. In Acts it says that he is our father. We are his offspring. In Acts 17, uh, in, in Acts 17 it talks about in him we live, we move, and have our being. But in the book of Acts it also says that he is our father. We are his offspring. So I'm trying to get this picture, or give you a picture that inside God is eternity. We lived in him before we came here. So inside God is a beautiful place. It's eternity. Inside the heart of God, it says our God is a consuming fire. Say it real loud. Our God is a consuming fire. That is His passion and love that burns for us. Well, there's something I've known for a long time that was God's heart. The stones of fire. Stones with fire. That's God's heart. Now, I didn't know what they were, but I knew for a long time that was where Lucifer walked. That's what I'm going to show you in the Word right now. Why it was such a travesty. Why Lucifer said he was like God. Why he thought he could take over heaven. Why he even fell. He was created like no other uh, created being that he made. He was made different than anybody else. Read Ezekiel 28 and get like three or four different translations of it and read it. And I don't have those papers, but I don't need them. I've said, I've, I've given this message so many times. But it talks about, uh, it's God telling Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy. It says the king of Tyre, but it's Lucifer. Because he says later in there, he said, I, you were in the Garden of Eden. And every precious stone was your covering in the day I made you. He's talking about Lucifer. You were the anointed cherub, the most beautiful cherub, the cherub that covereth. It doesn't say what he covered, but I'm going to tell you what he covered. He actually showed me this. He showed me all this. And I didn't understand it at first, but I got real excited when I saw. It shows you really how much you are his sons and daughters. He meant it when he said you were his offspring. You lived inside of him. He wanted to have you as a family. That's why he sent us here. But you have a free will that he will not mess with. The angels had free wills. They had to choose too. They had to make a choice for him or against him. So anyway, inside God is this beautiful place, eternity. We lived inside of him. We lived, we moved, we had our only existence was in him. We played there like little kids. That's why he wants you to come back as little kids. We played on the heart of God. We actually played on the stones of fire. In Ezekiel 28, it talks about Lucifer and the day he was made. And every precious stone was his covering. On the outside of Lucifer, it names all of the gemstones that God put on him. That is scriptural. A lot of people don't even know he was made like that. He was made like that because he was made to be a part of worship. He was put in charge of the worship in heaven as an archangel. That was his job. One third of the angels were under him. They were created to worship God. We take their place. He didn't make new ones. We worship him. We worship him instead. So Lucifer was put in charge of worship. And he said, you are the anointed cherub that covereth. I put all these precious gemstones on you. And the day I made you, I put pipes and tabrets in you. He could make music. Some people don't know that. He was made to be a part of worship. He actually could create music. None of the other angels could create. But he made him have the ability to be able to make music. That's why he tries to control music. He said, you the anointed cherub that covers, I have put you on my holy mount. That was inside God. Jesus and the Holy Spirit, it was the Word. Jesus' name before he came to earth and died for us, his name was the Word. The Word was with him, was with him from the beginning. And then when he chose to come and die for us, he was the first Son of God sent into the earth. Lived life like a man on this earth, and then his precious blood was shed to bring us back to God because Adam and Eve fell in the garden. And Lucifer was waiting.